So um, I think we're just going to start. Um, so hello, my name is Kieran Gaffney. I'm um, uh, an architect with the Edinburgh Architecture Association and I've uh, been helping to organise this talk along with Alice and who we will uh, meet a bit later. Um, so the first thing to say is that this event is being recorded and it will be posted on the EAA website and our YouTube channel. Um, attendees' cameras and mics are switched off by default, but and this, this helps with clarity and bandwidth. Um, um, to ask questions, we'd like you to use the chat function. Uh, you can ask questions throughout the event, uh, uh, which we'll collate, and then we'll ask Ryan at the end during a sort of Q&A session at the end. Um, so, uh, so welcome to this uh, first of a series of design-led talks. The EA have been doing a lot of kind of CPD and technical talks, and this is supposed to be more of a series about architecture and design. Um, so um, we felt, um, so COVID and online talks felt offered us an opportunity to invite people from a wider range of places, you know, people who might not otherwise be able to come and talk to us. And our approach here with this series is to invite people who are working on unusual uh, or in unexpected ways, but that are relevant to you know, our cultural condition in Edinburgh. So our speaker tonight is Ryan Kennan. Ryan's work is very beautiful and his buildings are particularly well made. His work and particular use of concrete and timber has been a reference source in my practice, for example, for, for some years. So I'm really excited to be introducing him. Ryan's from Chicago and studied at Cornell in New York. Um, his eastward move from it continued to Dublin in 2002, where he established his practice in 2007. He combines practice with teaching at University College Dublin and the Dublin School of Architecture at DIT, where he's currently a lecturer, as well as having taught at universities in Oslo, Pamplona and Porto. So I'm going to read a little bit from the practice um, just as an introduction. So the practice is committed to the creation of careful and timeless architecture. The buildings are designed with durability and permanence as primary objectives in order to make lasting and sustainable contributions to the lives of their clients and communities. Each project is ta a tailored response to the specific needs of individual clients. Uh, our work is unified by a desire to create characterful buildings and beautiful spaces. We believe that any valuable architecture must arise from a close reading of its local context, culture and history, thereby avoiding the contemporary trend towards superfluous form. Um, so the practice has won uh, numerous awards and commendations from the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland and the Architecture Association of Ireland, and they've exhibited in London, Chicago, and of course in Ireland. In 2018, they were included in the Giardini exhibition at the, VNS, the Venice Biennale. I'm really interested in Ryan's perspective as an American and as an outsider in Ireland and uh, how his architectural and cultural heritage impacts on his work. Um, Ryan has said that despite his Irish name, he's no direct Irish heritage and arrived in Dublin somewhat by chance in the people work from 2002. So um, with that, I'd like to pass over to Ryan and I'll, I'll um, let him share his screen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen. Thanks for that. Um, can you guys hear me okay, though, before you sign off there, Karen? Yes, we can hear you fine, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, great. I'll try the share here for one second. And you might just confirm you're able to see that too, Karen. That's great, Ryan. Yes, we can see that. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, um, so uh, thanks very much for having me and thanks everyone for coming along to listen um, at your dinner time. Um, and thanks for Kieran and Alice for the invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to speak to you guys actually. Um, Kieran uh, also uh, sent along some questions, I suppose, which some may be answered by lecture, others I might answer at the, at the end. And again, I would encourage anyone to uh, put anything into the chat you know, that comes to mind along the way. I'd be happy to answer any questions as, uh, at the end. I, I think it is kind of one of the very few benefits of this format. Um, it's not a compensation for us being able to go for a drink afterwards, but uh, it's nice nonetheless, I suppose, that there's some sort of conversation that people feel free to engage in, I guess. Um, so uh, I'll begin. Uh, so the, the lecture is uh, pretty loosely arranged around some of the uh, ideas, I suppose, that motivate all the work in the practice. Um, 
rather than going, let's say, on a project by project basis. Uh, and I'd like to begin with by speaking about a couple of the key ideas which are really foundational to practice and really everything that we do. Um, and so I hope you'll forgive me, I might read a bit here at the beginning, but then I'll ramble a lot after that. Um, yeah, so I, essentially I want to talk about the, the why we do what we do. Um, so it's more about whys and hows. Um, so uh, when I started making buildings and I started the practice, which as Kieran said was 2007, which is shocking to hear sometimes. Um, uh, I was thinking a lot about uh, about what the language of the buildings were, what the language of the architecture that we were making uh, was, and what it should be, um, and how how might the designs of the building communicate uh, both to me or to my clients or to people around the buildings or to the architectural culture, for instance. And at that time and still, I suppose, to some degree, I was quite critical of the culture of architecture generally, and I was sort of tired of this culture of architecture for architects. And the fact that really a whole lot of what I saw being made by architects seemed to me to be for and about themselves, really. Um, and you know, Karen briefly mentioned about my movement from the States uh, to Dublin, and certainly I, I suppose that that criticism of the culture was certainly coming a lot from where I was coming from. Um, so I really wasn't interested in making a kind of insular architecture that was valued by a select few. Uh, I thought that really, if we wanted to make a kind of a valuable contribution really to society, that the buildings, uh, and, and to make really buildings that could be valuable for their entire life, both aesthetically and functionally, then we should be able to make buildings where the designs are for and about the clients and the users and the places that they live. The buildings we make must be able to be to communicate with and be meaningful to our clients and their communities, while of course simultaneously being somehow capital A architecture or poetic architecture. And that you know these two perspectives, in my view, shouldn't be mutually exclusive. So in short, I kind of set out in a way to make local buildings for local people. Um, at the time, perhaps that was more of a radical proposition than it is now. And you know, in a way, I'm quite happy that to see really throughout Europe and certainly in the UK and here that this agenda seems to be catching on somehow. Uh, but at the time, and really from where I was coming from in the States, it, it, it was a sort of nearly radical proposition, I guess. Um, so once you have this sort of agenda, uh, the next question is, of course, how do you, how do, you do it? And firstly, it seems clear to me that making a building which is meaningful to clients in their community is more directly and powerfully achieved. If the language of design arises from their local built landscape. It's not simply about understanding or kind of knee jerk regionalism, but I think that our buildings have uh, can have a far more emotive effect on people when they are based in familiarity and in people's collective memory. And really, this basis can be a much more powerful origin, I think, than maybe always seeking for difference or you know, uniqueness for its own sake. So there are two uh, ideas which are central to how we work and how we think about and really utilize this kind of local build landscape. And they are type and uh, an idea I call uh, building culture. So of course, we can think about architecture as a language. Um, like a vocabulary of forms and materials and structures which have the potential to communicate with people. But of course, for one to understand a language, we must be familiar with its rules and its vocabulary, i.e. the parts and how they come together. One way of thinking about these common elements is through the lens of type. The type can be thought of really quite broadly, but it might encompass a lot more than just say programs like church or school or what have you, or, and it might be more than just form, but it could be thought about through construction or structures or landscape types, etc. All of these things can be thought about in a way typologically. And one might argue that this categorization, that these types are central to architecture's ability to communicate, central to architecture as, as a language. The type, in a way, can be thought of as the vocabulary of architecture. And of course, the following question is what language should, should you speak? And really today, in my view, uh, there's a real persistent lure, I suppose, through our interconnectivity and 
global access to architecture all over the world, that there's a persistent lure for the international uh, attention, I guess, somehow. And that much architectural language tends towards these kind of universals or towards the intensely personal. And so for me, it was important to resist both of these poles since in, in my view, they limit the ability of, of architecture to connect with people, I guess. Um, so since the focus of our work was on the clients and the people who surround these buildings in order for them to be meaningful, I think that our buildings have to speak a local language that my work in Ireland really can't speak German. So in order for our buildings to arise from a local language, we often study what I refer to as a local building culture. And by building culture, I mean not simply high culture of architecture as an art form, but really the ordinary day-to-day -day culture of building. And this is the culture that produces like the ordinary everyday environment, built environment. And it arises from the interactions of the building industry and builders and skill and material availability and banks and planning laws, et cetera, all of these things must come together to make all buildings. And all of these elements are informed by place and by time, by local. It is the building culture of any place and time that, that affects and defines the character of that, of that place far more than any architect does. So it's why, for instance, the uh, 1950s houses in Ireland are very different than 1950s houses in uh, Dublin and why we might have, say, uh, building culture which produces amazing environments like we see on the left and uh, less amazing environments like we see on the right. And I think it's important, I suppose, that where valuable and interesting building cultures are, uh, are found, that uh, we architects should support them. So to link these two ideas, really, we could state in short that local building cultures, local cultures of building cultivate local type in a broad sense. And these local types form a vocabulary of language that everyone who is from a place can understand somehow intuitively. These types are layered into single objects depending on one's analysis, from formal to constructional to functional. And seen through this lens, an ordinary building of any region can embody and reflect somehow this whole interconnected system of, of a building culture. So all of our work is really based on this uh, morphology of local type vis-a-vis -vis local building culture. Uh, I like to think about this interaction between our work and its local context as one that seeks out opportunities for resonance within a web of interrelated types. In this context, every type to which our architecture may refer creates a resonance where meaning and collective memory and emotion can all be evoked. If a building is able to resonate across many local types from the formal to the structural to the material to historical, then one's sight and experience and intellect are all activated through this proliferation somehow of association. And the buildings, I hope, uh, become open and communicative to anyone from that place. It's through this layered resonance that we're really trying to make a culturally specific architecture that's very much deeply embedded in and also supportive of local building culture, really wherever we find it. So I'd like to begin really uh, by talking about several projects which I think illustrate these ideas or these foundational ideas um, in maybe a number of different contexts here in the country. Uh, so the first project I'll show is based in uh, Galway, um, in the far west of Ireland. Um, you know, a lot of times when I do this lecture, I have to explain what the weather conditions are like in places like this. And I have to explain the pervasiveness of the gray and the rain and the mist and the lack of heat. But I somehow feel that you all are probably intimately familiar with these concepts. So, um, so uh, in a way, the Western Galway probably is similar to many places in, in Scotland. Um, it's a sort of uh, utterly beautiful, but sort of rugged as well uh, place with you know, very few trees and vegetation. Uh, when you get a tree, of course, they grow like this. It's a very rocky terrain, and really traditionally material resources were quite limited out in the west of Ireland. So uh, really throughout Ireland, I suppose there's uh, several prevalent building uh, typologies. 
the way the typologies generally, both urban and rural in the country traditionally were really fairly limited. The building culture here has been restricted historically by a number of factors, I suppose, from its isolation at the edge of Europe, <clears throat> um, from limited material resources. Um, certain countries took a lot of the trees here uh, historically. So um, uh, quality of tree was not great, but quality of stone and clay was. Um, it's also been the types have been limited by relative poverty, really, especially through the 20th century, uh, which limited building skills. I think as much of local talent was uh, exported to the UK or to America. Um, and of course, limited by, by, by the climate generally, by uh, the rain um, and uh, I suppose it's temperate climate. Um, these, these limitations on the building culture uh, have limited the variety of type, but I don't think it's limited richness at all. Um, so the, the, the vehicles through which uh, uh, a local society is expressed um, are not great in number, but I suppose their variety is and their richness and interest is to me. So um, one of those most dominant types, which we find really right across the country is exemplified here in these uh, drawings, which is the, the farmstead or the um, farmyard typology. Um, and I'm sure you know we see farmyard types right across uh, Europe. Uh, here, uh, they are tend to be about creating a microclimate uh, where one could do work um, and uh, with some degree of shelter. And we see in a way that they're all based on a similar set of ideas or limitations, right? That it's a series of very simple, single room deep uh, buildings arranged around a courtyard that the buildings are limited by the technology of stone or earth construction and by the amount of span that could be achieved in a timber roof. Um, so right across the country, you have similar forms resulting from similar conditions. <clears throat> and we see here again that there tend to be you know, simple gable buildings, but quite interesting and rich in their variety. And what's really unique, I suppose, in Ireland uh, is that all those limitations, especially the poverty throughout the 20th century, has meant that these building types are still used. And a lot of the reference points for our work, I think, are only valid and really avoid a kind of danger of nostalgia, really, because uh, the building types are still everywhere. They haven't been knocked down. They are still used. And so you see uh, maybe very successful or growing farms where, which may have had you know, this traditional farmyard with a house as part of the kind of composition of buildings, but has expanded over and over and over again over time to add, you know, larger barns and different types of barns, but still having the same idea of created, creating sheltered external environments for people to work and live. So our site here is in the west uh, near the shores of Loch Corrib. Um, the client was returning home and uh, having worked for many years on the other side of the country, and she grew up in this house right here. I'm hoping you can see my mouse now. Um, and really in the ensuing years, a whole bunch of these things had gone in, which are kind of, uh, kind of characterless bungalows and she was uh, very much interested in the traditional buildings, I suppose. And there was a, one of these farmyards, like very much like what I showed you a minute ago, right down here. And her site was up here. And so uh, this is simple volumes arranged a, around a south facing courtyard to create a warm microclimate. And so it seemed like a very still rational approach and one which addressed the enduring conditions there. Uh, our plan then uh, was derived from this organizational strategy and reference and resonance to it. So we have a kind of service site here, we're creating an entry block and courtyard. Uh, we have the kind of public rooms here, the entry, the study, living and dining, and then we have another block, uh, which is all the kind of bedrooms and bathrooms. And they create this sheltered courtyard facing facing south. Um, and so on the left, you have a picture of that uh, farm building I showed you in plan and our building on the right. So um, in a way, there's a, a both an organizational resonance, but also a formal resonance of these kind of two gables with the courtyard between. Um, when seen across the landscape, in a way, it seems quite normal to begin with or unremarkable, frankly. Um, but as we start to approach the building, uh, it becomes you know, clear that it's not quite the ordinary thing. Um, and these very large chimneys uh, certainly are a sign of that. 
Um, so we have the kind of formal and we have the organizational, but also I'm interested in resonating with how things are made, um, the reasons for being rather than just the aesthetics of the things. So these are both walls from right next to the site, which are you know typical uh, rural concrete essentially, which is made in stacks. You know, so you'd have a rather than having a complete formwork, you'd do a formwork and raise it up in lifts, um, and it's very rough, right, and very characterful. And so when we had this idea of using concrete, we were interested in making it you know, similar as possible to that type of rough rural con concrete. Um, and then structurally, you know, as I said, that you know there were these material limitations, of course, and we find typically in these buildings are all limited in their width by the scales available and the type of timber that's available, um, which in many cases is like this, right? Uh, very crooked and uh, rough hewn, um, and uh, often quite dark because the chimneys were leaky and the fires were leaky, and so you get this kind of soot staining over a limed white uh, surface. And one of the other features you find in these buildings due to the lack of uh, quality timber construction is that um, certainly in the 20th century, uh, you would find that you know, these roofs fail a lot. And when they fail, they push out. You know, they don't really have great uh, resistance to horizontal forces. And so they're pushing out on these uh, rubble stone walls laid in line that don't have a great deal of horizontal resistance. And so in the 20th century, you get people pouring a lot of these ring beams around the cap of the walls to kind of bind the things together. So um, we find this again throughout the country, but also here again in this uh, farmyard right, right next door, where again, you can see where there's these ring or eaves beams uh, poured to sort of compensate somehow for a uh, not the best timber structure. So um, so that was something I was interested in, right? What, what is this ring beam and what can it do for us? And um, is it something that could be incorporated into our project? So we get this, you know, very masonry, very straightforward block construction below, and then this opportunity for a tectonic expression above that line involving a ring beam. And our ring beam uh, then uh, uh, does several other things. It, we actually took away all of the horizontal resistance in the roof, so it's a, it does all of the lateral resistance to the horizontal thrust, um, but also takes into account uh, the guttering. So it's parapet as well, I suppose. Um, and internally, again, we we're interested in these kind of white walls, the exposed uh, expression of that structure and a kind of dark, uh, quite simply built timber ceiling, kind of ordinary pine. Uh, Kieran asked me for some uh, construction details because a lot of the lecturing I'm doing, I suppose, is to students and uh, perhaps professionals might find this uh, more interesting. So uh, I copied this across here from our files, which I dug out. Um, and as you can see, everyone asked me in this building, is the concrete thermally broken? And of course it is. So um, it's actually trickier done than it appears here because on one side, the, there's a kind of cladding beam on, on the outside and the structural beam on the inside, they are tied and do operate together um, because rebar goes through. Um, but on the other side, that switches and the cladding beam is inside and the glazing layer is here. So the beam plan for this is actually fairly complicated. But I suppose um, all of the construction technology here is very ordinary. And the budgets for really all of my work is very ordinary. Um, so we're trying to make the most out of a classic, very standard construction, block work wall, the concrete person lived 200 yards away from the site, the, the timber work was all uh, locally supplied and locally um, constructed and thermally broken. Um, so uh, uh, in a way we could look at the two poles of, of, of buildings in the landscape in Ireland between these two poles, right? The kind of classic vernacular cottage, which arises as a direct result of the material produced by needing to make agriculture, right? Clearing fields to make and use oil, um, make gives us stone that we can make buildings out of. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have this kind of uh, Neo-Palladian, um, you know, very high architecture of the manor house and uh, outbuildings. But, Actually, I'm kind of more interested in this kind of middle ground world where you get the blending of the kind of vernacular tradition and the kind of higher architectural tradition 
mixing in really most of the kind of rural housing. Uh, so you have the kind of more strictly vernacular on one side, the kind of high architectural building on the other side where it's somehow tempered by and uh, made more humble somehow by local construction techniques and lime rather than cut stone, for instance. But then you get this really great middle world where, you know, there's this kind of formality brought to what are otherwise very humble structures with proportioned windows and ideas about symmetry. So it's in that kind of middle world that I was very interested in, continue to be interested in. So, uh, you know, when we had this building uh, that had a certain vernacular quality, I was also interested in its kind of high architectural qualities and um, ideas about symmetry and you know, these chimneys which were brought to it. And so we have this kind of very formal colonnade onto that perfect square of a central courtyard. And that perfect square is you know, highly manicured, including a carefully placed cat. Um, as opposed to a very uh, wild, let's say, uh, field beyond. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to show a couple of projects uh, which are not uh, available outside of the lecture, I guess, which is hopefully interesting to you. Um, so a couple of projects which haven't gotten built, but do speak again to this interest in resonating across type construction and kind of very local response. So. This project is also in the West in a town called Chum. Um, and this is a house that's a suburban house really um, to the town of Chum. And so it's a detached suburban house that was to be constructed right here. And still hopefully maybe one day. Um, and this is, this is not the house. Um, this is in a way is a typical detached uh, house of, of this variety. And I, I, when I see a house like this, um, sure it lacks architectural quality, but it also relates to one of the dominant building uh, house types in the country, which is a kind of classic central hall, three bay house, um, two story house. And we see this type, you know, right back through history from 18th century pattern books um, to, uh, you know, a typical priest's house right through the 19th century <clears throat> and a million different iterations from ones which aspire to a kind of high, high architecture to uh, others which are you know, very much informal vernacular buildings. Um, and a lot of times you get them, I suppose, looking at how they operate. They sometimes have these kind of flourishes or architectonics that set them into kind of a three-tiered tripartite scheme with a kind of base, a middle, and a, and a, and a cap somehow. Um, you know, we see that again right across all of them. And we tend to have these kind of lined, lined windows and implications of tectonics, which, which are really done in, in, in plaster. So with the, all of this in mind, we were given this site, which uh, the project really was not ordinary in a couple of ways. One is the site was this slightly strange uh, parallelogram shape. Um, and number two, the client was uh, a family who had a, a child who had suffered a traumatic brain injury. And so was um, confined to bed all of the time, essentially, and was left in a, a vegetative state, but they wanted uh, him to be uh, involved as much as possible in the life of the family. And so we end up with, we plan the building around having this kind of suite of, of bedroom and facilities for him, but immediately adjacent to, you know, the kitchen and living and dining areas of the house as much as possible. Um, and so the plan evolves out of adopting a geometry, which gives him kind of the best view of the living uh, of the house, but also tries to make a facade, uh, which addresses the street and, uh, sides, obviously, which address the site. <clears throat> and the ground floor then, uh, rather than being uh, tripartite, is really bipartite along this along this line. Um, and is accumulated really through a series of perpendicular rooms and parallelogram rooms. Uh, the first flip floor then is kind of more traditionally tripartite, except with kind of service elements along the, the center lines and the bedrooms in the corner. Again, accommodating the most strange geometry of the site. Uh, here's a render, I suppose, which shows in a way, again, this uh, ambition to resonate with the tripartite and a lot of its maybe rules about how it operates, uh, but also that it's kind of familiar and different at the same time. It is it's very much like it and very much not like it through its detailing, its kind of stack tectonic, through the fact that there's two windows down below and three above, and they're all slightly asymmetrical and pushed and pulled as the building twists around the corners.
And then structurally, there's this uh, hopefully very clear idea of a kind of, you know, a, a very straightforwardly constructed masonry shell into which we're placing a sort of a tectonic uh, element of these primary structural elements, and then a series of expressed choice as we often like to do. It gives you this nice snoodle, I guess, is the architectural term for that type of winding view. So again, we're staying out west, and really a lot of our work has been continues to be out west. Um, here's another house which did not get built, and hopefully, hopefully we'll come back around. Um, out in Ballyvon in North Clare, and people would know this area perhaps because it's, it's, it's really the Burren, um, so very I suppose, well known for its absolute barrenness and scenic drama. Um, but really, it's a completely stony landscape. And uh, when we look across the landscape, you see stone and you see stone walls, and that's about all. Um, the stone walls, of course, are arising from the need to try to make areas where soil can be retained, but also then obviously to allow for commonage and grazing wherever possible. So any map of the place is really defined by these uh, stone organizations of the landscape. Uh, we, the site was just outside the town here, again, in and amongst many of those stone walls, which come down from the hilltop and then right, run right through the village. Again, quite clear, I suppose, in, in, this, in this image about how they run right over the top of the mountain, these kind of single stone walls and right down and really then containing within them varying degrees of useful agricultural space. So the idea for this project then was more to uh, look at the kind of control of the landscape somehow as a as a, a way of resonating with the place rather than it being about, uh, let's say, a, a more typical house type building. Um, and so you can kind of make it out in this axonometric down in the bottom here that really we were placing the building amongst these stone dry, dry stone walls um, and it, it itself was made of them. So all we were planning to do was to add several dry stone walls within this field and then to roof them. Uh, so the plan ends up kind of looking like this, uh, which is, you know, existing field walls kind of blended in with walls that we were making primarily these uh, four walls. And then the house, which is kind of public rooms, very straightforward plan wise uh, at this level and then half a level down private rooms uh, moving out in this direction so that all rooms would kind of address, uh, you know, an entrance, a different courtyards, different enclosed external gardens that again would be protected and resist the western winds. Um, the roof caps then are somehow kind of quite dramatic. They're these uh, large concrete beams essentially, which just stack quite simply, again, using that kind of rough uh, country concrete. <clears throat> and really the idea of the roof having these kind of two beams and then somehow catching the rain and delivering it to one or the other end of those uh, contained beams uh, was sort of derived from these structures, which again are more agricultural structures, which you find throughout the landscape out there, which are water troughs for grazing cattle and sheep. And essentially all they do is they make a very wide surface in stone that delivers all the water to then a stone trough. So you're collecting rainwater uh, for uh, livestock. <clears throat> so we're kind of interested, I guess, both in referring to, yeah, as I said, more agricultural landscape than housing landscape. And we're also collecting our water for the sheep. Okay, and then a town building, and again, uh, you know, Ireland's towns developed quite a lot in the 18th century um, and early 19th century when the country was booming. And um, uh, I suppose town buildings tend to be terraced houses on terraced plots. And maybe unlike some towns in the UK, there's a sort of informality, I think, about, uh, uh, about town buildings in Ireland. Um, where they were less concerned about, uh, say, presenting a formal front to the street where everything is symmetrical and aligned. Um, instead, they were interested in making symmetries internally, right? So the, a window would be placed on a wall symmetrically from the room side, but due to the asymmetrical arrangement between floors, you get these kind of, you know, lovely shifty uh, street facades. And we find this really right across the country. 
Um, and so uh, here's another one on the left, and here is our building on the right, which is very much uh, sort of trying to resonate with this way, of, or well, that it would look like these buildings somehow, right? That it would resonate with how they work form formally, but also that it would arise from the same organizational principles. So uh, these elevations arise from the fact that we are making windows which are symmetrical within the rooms that end up like this externally. Buildings for a, a kind of community center, which is related to the town's uh, large, uh, largest church up on the hill, and it's an extension of one of these two symmetrical buildings at the gate of the of the forecourt of the church. So this is us right here, and so I was really interested in it being very quiet, right, very subtle, and good neighbor, um, and being derived from the logic of town buildings, and so. You can see, I suppose, this is one of my favorite views of it, that, you know, again, it is very much like all of these things be around it, be they a uh, 19th century townhouse here or a 20th century uh, ugly, ordinary extension here, that somehow it's very much part of that landscape. It's, it's ordinary and unordinary. Um, and hopefully quiet next to the neighbor. Um, and I suppose internally, then, we were interested in referring somehow to its neighbor and having this kind of large meeting hall at the first floor, which resonated with its uh, sacred ecclesiastical neighbor. Um, so the ground floor plan is a series of meeting rooms and counseling rooms. Uh, and again, you know, all of the windows are uh, more or less uh, symmetrical. And then at first floor, we have this kind of large meeting space. And again, the, the windows and openings into and out of that large room are symmetrical to itself, but asymmetrical externally. So again, trying to, I suppose, evolve the language out of the existing language, but also uh, that it would evolve through operating in the same way, um, that its origins were I suppose similar rather than just copying an aesthetic. Um, and here you see, I suppose, a bit of the play or sort of uh, architectural communication where we were playing with, I suppose, scaling the windows internally to the scale of the room that they were onto and controlling the structure of the lintel, the height of the lintel. Um, so smaller rooms get bigger lintels externally and vice versa. <clears throat> so I think this sort of gets me on to then. Um, uh, maybe just to dive a little deeper into some of these uh, ideas. And um, uh, this kind of resonance, I think, is really clear in this image with uh, the building and relating to its, its neighbor. And while this approach, uh, I suppose, is aiming for some sort of authenticity through the ordinary, through ordinary form and construction, but in a way, all of these buildings have a slippage uh, away from the ordinary that, that draws the buildings towards perhaps something you might call the uncanny. I, I kind of think of this term, well, I mean, people think about this term a lot as, as being about haunted houses and Frankenstein and things like this. Um, but I, I think it be, can be pulled back from a caricature that the implication of the ordinary and the familiar in these materials and forms might make someone comfortable and, and open a building to them, make it somehow initially understandable. And then the slippage away from that ordinary uh, makes you slightly unsteady, perhaps opening a door and drawing you in to some kind of architectural experience. Like, you know, I know what this is, and then I don't know what this is. And in that, there's a, a sort of question. Some of these references are more ephemeral or at a distance, and some of them are about how the buildings operate, and some of them are really immediate and direct, like you see between these two gables right next to each other in this, in this image. And one common theme, I suppose, which, which certainly motivates a lot of the work that we're, we're, we're doing, which builds out of the uncanny, is this idea of the double. And we think of the double in film or literature as being about you know, the evil twin, the cyborg, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, but here, again, I, I, the double, I suppose, can move away from the car caricature and can be about uh, this kind of direct resonance um, of, of enabling and what the double does it enables simultaneity right or thinking about it in that way enables simultaneity between something which is known and unknown between the type and a variation on the type between something which is old and new 
uh, that all these things are somehow then given equal footing and there is a friction and uh, energy, I suppose, between these oppositions through the double. Uh, you know, Bruce Banner is the Hulk and he is not the Hulk at the same time. And I guess our buildings are hoping to be old and new and modern and traditional and boring and beautiful at the same time. And so we see this, this in the things I've shown you earlier in Ligon um, and just quickly some of the other houses here, in, I mean, other projects here, you know, we, we were invited to do this uh, conceptual project about an extension to the Dulwich Gallery. And so this kind of looking forward and looking back, Giannis figure was uh, motivational. Um, or in a lot of the kind of extensions we're doing and renovations of, of townhouses um, uh, are also based on this idea of the double. So uh, we have a Victorian building uh, above here and our extension to the bottom where I was interested in this uh, timber lintel under which we got a kind of collection of forms on the top and these recessed entrances on the bottom. And so that mode of operating generated the your extension as well. That these buildings, we can extend the building in a way which has conversations with the existing, rather than again, always kind of pushing for this kind of dramatic difference of old versus new. Uh, or here with the kind of 1930s housing, which is so typical in Ireland, um, uh, uh, where again, you know, the language is about these, you know, very simple uh, concrete uh, sand cement, all about render basically, uh, pebble dash versus the smooth. Uh, and so again, trying to evolve a language out of that, in which case um, it becomes a series of frames, which we then draw inside. For this project for a very important Jordan Street, Henrietta Street, um, where we were uh, and are still uh, working on extending the building at the far left side of this image, but I was interested in the block as a whole. And that on the far right side of the image, you can see there's a, a 19th century a library building, which was our 18th century library building, which was extended in the 19th century with one extra bay. And when you go around to the side, you see that that bay was slightly set back and has this contemporary language uh, on the very end. And so we were extending on the very opposite side of that block. And so the proposal was again, operating in a similar way, right? Having this uh, very slight step um, and a kind of uh, an arched formal language which spoke on either side then, had gave it a sort of simultaneity of past and present of, uh, yeah, old and new. Uh, just very quickly, I suppose, I am, I, uh, again, Karen was interested in some details. So um, uh, this is a project which we'd recently finished for a house uh, extension in a Victorian neighborhood in Dublin, which is filled with these types of details and the house itself has these type of details where, you know, they're relatively plain um, brick constructions, but whenever we're making a window or a door, that that's sort of an opportunity to make this very slight and interesting stepped brick details. And so uh, with that in mind, we were also interested in dealing with, you know, what is very typical in these types of buildings, which the street is to the right, garden is to the left here. Uh, we have the hall. I'm sure you guys have types of buildings very much like this. Uh, where the hall, you enter into the hall, the stairs go up, and then you have a series of kind of hall spaces in the two main reception rooms of the house. And that, of course, we needed to extend across the back of that and wanted a connection through these rooms out to the garden. But the axis for that is asymmetrical then and the overall width of the site. And I was interested and in sort of prefer, in a way, symmetrical relationships in these terrace buildings to the garden. So how could we deal with that asymmetrical connection with a symmetrical garden facade. And so the stepped details of the brick became the way that we could do that. We would have an outer face, as you can see here, which was you know, kind of flat on and created a large symmetrical opening to the garden, but then the stepping allowed us to shift that axis um, in a sort of interesting tectonic way. And then there's kind of variations on the theme. And you can see here, I suppose, in the detail that it's a pretty standard uh, masonry cavity construction um, with a concealed lintel. Um, and then, you know, just kind of maybe some subtle details about stepping the bricks and bricks on edge to separate the kind of lintel piece of brick from the 
the edge, uh, the kind of post piece of brick. And at, at one time, at one minute, it looks kind of very massive, but then, you know, as it steps away, it looks like what it is, which is brick leaf. And the section is changing, or the plan detail is changing every step of the way. It's like that at one point. Uh, internally, the building then uh, we kind of folded in that kind of garden facade, and really that type of brick makes up the entire brick uh, uh, rear facade of all of these houses. And so we were folding that in to make a very textured interior, and then to sort of soften it. We were lining everything. And this section shows the kind of trick of this, which is that you know you end up with a trapped room in the middle of the plan, and so we were created this light tunnel through the middle of the house, you know, which delivers light into the what would otherwise be the darkest place. Okay, so um, uh, I'm very behind. Okay, so I might speed through some of these here if I haven't been speeding through others. Um, the uh, a lot of these references are very direct and that they can be read, you know, within the immediate vicinity of where the buildings are being placed. And this. Uh, project, which is again for a house, the reference is more distant across the country from one side to the other, almost on exactly the same latitude line. The site we were given is in Clifton, which is a small town in the far west of Galway, and it was actually on a floodplain right here. And it was on the one piece of high ground in the floodplain. And so we knew that as the town expanded, as it is doing, you know, it's kind of suburbia would kind of wrap around it. Um, but that no one else would be able to build next to us. There would always be this kind of landscape in this uh, this object in a floodplain landscape. And it reminded me, I suppose, of this building, which is the Casino at Marino, which is a uh, really, truly amazing neoclassical building I'll get into in a second, which is in Dublin and was built as a garden folly in the, the grounds of a much larger estate. Of course, over the centuries, it has now been swallowed by suburban, suburban Dublin and exists thankfully has managed to survive right here. So it's like this sort of uh, object in a landscape, though the landscape is completely changed. Um, the building itself looks like, on the one hand, something which is symmetrical in all directions and a classic you know, garden folly with one big room in it. Um, but it's amazing because of its, uh, its actual complexity when you get into it. it actually consists of 16 rooms and three stories. When you look at the section, uh, you can sort of get into some of its in, in ingenuity. It was actually by a chamber, uh, by Richard Chambers, is the architect. Um, and uh, so you can see there's a kind of service floor uh, with kitchens and storage and things like that at the ground floor. There's the kind of primary reception floor. And then there's this attic floor. The attic floor gets all of its uh, light from these trapped courtyards in the corners, which are not visible. So none of the windows are visible externally uh, uh, from the attic floor. When we look at the plan, it's uh, very elegant and controls uh, to get you a, a number of different scaled spaces within, again, what looks like externally to be similarly scaled spaces. And when we look closer at the windows, we can see that you know a scale of window, which uh, is suitable to the landscape and the size of the building externally and to the large room internally does not necessarily suit a, a room which is smaller uh, uh, in, on this location and this location. And so he goes to the trouble to conceal or to mask out the size of the window internally so that it's proportional to the, the room and to the openings into the room. So you get this sort of covered window between in and out. Uh, the top floor, as I said, gets all of its light from these sort of courtyards and there's internal downpipes in the columns and we could go on and on. It's absolutely pure genius, this building. That scaling, again, you see happens in section as well, right? So that the scale of the window, which is appropriate to the volume, is not appropriate to the room, and so they get scaled down. OK, so it's kind of a box of tricks, and the box of tricks is unbelievably well executed. Um, you can see here that then we know behind this window that, in fact, most of this uh, window does not open to the interior. And you can see it here. You can just kind of make out. So they painted that, what is it, wall here black, and then they went to the added uh, trouble to put glass in, which is cambered and aimed slightly up at the sky so that when you see, when you look at this window externally, which you primarily see is reflection of the sky, you do not see all the black stuff concealing it. 
So it's pure genius, and what I'm going to show you is less so, but uh, hopefully still interesting. Um, so in a way, I was interested in these things communicating across the country, that they were sort of a double of each other across time and space and having a conversation. So on the right, and here we have our proposal, which is again, this thing which is somehow symmetrical and somehow not, somehow appears quite simple, but uh, is not quite what you expect. The plan is very much derived from uh, the casino. You come here, walk through this kind of central service, and then the rooms are laid about uh, around this kind of central block. The client had one request, which was she wanted curves. I tried to give her curves in section, and she said, no, Ryan, I must have curves in plan. And so uh, it was a challenge for me, I suppose, at the time, uh, something I'm, I've embraced now. But uh, you get these kind of nice thresholds between rooms where there's a pinch between a curve and the block. Uh, upstairs, um, it's a series of rooms joined and interconnected in a sort of open matrix, which I quite enjoy. And the windows then are only in these kind of curved areas, which give light directly to the rooms, but also light these corner spaces which are open then to below. So light comes from these upper corners and drifts down the curves into the lower living rooms. You can kind of see that here. In a way, I thought of the curves as being somehow slightly justified in my mind by the fact that they're implicated with structure somehow or contaminated with structure. So the structure is that there are these concrete corner curved walls, concrete beams which connect them corner to corner and then intersect and create this kind of void. Uh, that links them up. So the structure and curves are somehow linked, as we see here. Sorry, going very fast. Conscious of time here. Okay, so um, uh, in this idea, our question about the structure um, and its role in, I suppose, form giving, uh, I bring you then to another rural house uh, in Carlo in a place called Bailala. Uh, this is the house we were given uh, to start with, which is a sort of horrible thing and very typical. And a pro a, it becomes a project that we have a lot, which is that people either inherit or buy sites in rural landscapes, with houses on them that they don't particularly like, but if uh, they can't knock down either for budgetary reasons or in order to get planning, they need a house on a site because otherwise you need a local need. So. Uh, in this case, it was about stripping this kind of thing, which we couldn't get rid of back to its core elements, and then uh, trying to make a project which read as a whole, even though it was really just an extension, or as a singular thing. Uh, in this hilly landscape, the kind of typical cottages and farmyards are more relaxed in their geometry, more uh, bendy and angly. Um, and so Sorry, the thing stopped clicking here. Like this. Just looks like it's trying to load the next one, Ryan. I'm not sure. Of course, it ran perfectly before <laughs> on the air here. Give me one. Oh, give me one second. Okay. I just want to add, you don't need to feel like you have to rush around. Just, just really enjoying the talk and take your time. Okay. Thanks. The whole thing went blank. Sorry guys, give me one second. You can cut this part out in uh, post-production, right? Yeah, can do. But yeah, you'll have your whole team on it, I'm sure.
Okay. So, um, yeah. So in a way, we're we're trying to be again quite quite specific, not link, looking at the type across the country, looking at how it is right there. This house on the left is again uh, less than a kilometer away from from our site. So this is the end result on the right, where you, the building we started with, which you the beautiful thing you saw at the beginning there. Um, uh, uh, is on the left, and then our extension is on the right. And somehow uh, it was added to in this informal way, which allows the extension, which is essentially a big hall room, to turn and face face the view, and then to kind of unify it as if it was a single project built at, at, at one time uh, by eliminating some of the uncharacteristic uh, or unfortunately characteristic uh, porches and fake chimneys and things like this that were on the original. Uh, you can see it here. Um, in the overall plan, this is the existing building, and then our our addition, and really, um, you know, everything in this building uh, we took as a given, um, and so we use the same pitch as the original building. We use the same ridge height. We use the same width of the building and plan as the original house had for the extension, and in a way, I guess I was questioning at the time the authenticity of doing something like that, and. Uh, uh, in a way, I return to structure and to construction. And um, we see with the building on the left, um, which is you know a 19th century typical cottage building, which is made in a rubble stone masonry wall, which acts primarily in compression. And uh, there are roof rafters, which don't get very big of a span and probably came from Scandinavia. And when we look on the right, we have a new building, which meets all of the new sustainability regulations and uh, serves modern life in the country and responds to the environment. And it's virtually the same, not just in form, but also in construction. You know, it's sure it's a cavity wall, but it's impressive masonry wall. The timber is a simple rafter roof. Uh, uh, timber probably came from Scandinavia as well. So in a way, the form to me still is relevant because it still addresses contemporary needs and still arises from uh, the restrictions of construction, the material availability, the knowledge here, and the environment. So where we find this sort of, I suppose, endurance of form and construction, um, I think it's perfectly valid to uh, end up with similar results and to derive your results from those, from those same origins. So as I say, we took everything uh, that this building gave us. All we did was we lengthened the, the rafters. So we got this kind of protected zone around the house. Um, and then we added these kind of uh, windows of key points, which were intended to be like like a, almost a glass curtain hung from those outer eaves. Um, you can see them on the front then and on the back. So I was interested and continue to be interested in structure. And it's certainly one of the central themes in the practice, I suppose, to use structure and think about it spatially and experientially uh, in really every project we do. Um, and here then where I was interested in using this form and justifying it vis-a-vis -vis structure, I was also interested in it being you know, somehow a very primitive structure, I guess. And you know, a ridge supported rafter roof is one of the most primitive. Um, and most ancient uh, types of structure. So, you know, I did many of these types of sketches looking at how it might become a sort of bayed structure to make this hall. And it might, you know, say, have a post or a tie or vice versa. And we ended sort of in this version where we had a ridge. There was one post which landed, another post which landed on a tie beam, and then another post which was embedded in the wall. Get us a four bayed structure, which obviously has references not just to ancient timber buildings, but to people like Shinohara and contemporary references. So we have the existing house on the left, which we did very little to internally. Uh, externally, we tidied it up. And then our kind of large hall where we have a post on one bay, a tie beam that catches a post on another beam, and then an embedded post here that gets us an external porch, uh, small room and a small upstairs uh, workout. And then those kind of curtain windows. Here you see it in section. Um, and then here, I suppose, thinking about what the experience of that is, and I'm very interested in uh, yeah, the experience of, 
of structure as something which is a fact, which will be always a fact, I suppose, right? That, 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 that timber is bearing the weight of, uh, of, of the roof and will have that same, I suppose, power uh, as long as this building exists. So it has a sort of timeliness or endurance as well. Um, and then trying to tune these things somehow. And so um, we're often thinking about structure as like a figure in the room and a figure against uh, either something abstract or against something textured. So, you know, take those rafters, which are again, our, you know, standard pine rafters. We've uh, made them as close as the carpenter would allow us to um, so that they would kind of vibrate somehow and be a kind of textured backdrop for a kind of figure. Um, and so that tuning structure for experience is certainly something that we're interested in all the time. Again, to maybe get into some of the details uh, uh, as per request. Um, so this is the detail of that window, which you see here. Um, and you can see, I suppose, that the roof is made up of, of those rafters, which extend uh, out to the point uh, here that we get kind of insulated. Uh, the roof construction really, it just takes the insulation. And again, in all these roofs where we're showing our joists, all we do is take the insulation from between or below the joists and put it on top. Um, and then we uh, do a series of buttons and tiles in this case. Um, in this case, in the earlier version, we uh, had a batten running within half the insulation in that direction, another one running within half the insulation going up and down the roof. And then that gets screwed all the way through all of these buttons and into the, into the rafters. Um, to make our sort of court and windows, which, you know, conceptually or experientially dangle from the end of the eaves. In fact, of course, it's, it's had to be propped. So we do have this kind of steel element, which uh, anchors that back to a, a base beam. Um, and importantly, in this case, you know, by putting the eaves beam here and having the window outside of it, you get the light coming in and drifting over the top of it without it being sealed. And so you get this kind of nice leakage over the top. And of course, those of you with the keener eyes will notice that, yes, that is a flitch beam. Uh, and here's the more typical detail, again, where the eaves beam runs around the room and does bear the weight of the rafters, which then transfers that load to the, to the walls. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say we also didn't have a gutter on any of it, um, which was contentious, but works actually beautifully. And we just have a French drain here, and it has grown in just fine, even in, even in Ireland for those of you in Scotland feeling adventurous. OK. Uh, one last thing on the windows. You know, um, I, I was sort of tired, I suppose, of these uh, chunky square windows that we get. And we had an opportunity to um, design the windows for this house. And so you know, we have this requirement of a structural depth to hold double glazing. And that often just gets translated into a square. But of course, you know. Previously, we used to know about how to control the frames of a window that it would still provide structural width necessary to uh, support the structure requirements of the window and the glazing and the wind loads. But we would control how that uh, depth or width appeared by the kind of scotias and uh, ornament along the edges of, of the windows uh, where you would reflect light from the sides. And so um, to diminish the overall width, this is a photograph from my office, which is a 1790s Georgian building. So it diminishes the apparent width of the mullions. And so we sort of evolved our own version of that, a much simpler version, but it has the same effect that you read the width of the windows much more slenderly than they would otherwise be. And so we get this kind of really elegant framing that is actually 60 mil. OK. Um, along those same lines about structure, uh, we just completed this one up in North Dublin. Um, and again, it's in this case not referring to one of these uh, farmyard. It is in fact built right within one of these farmyard type buildings. Um, and so we were given this ruined farmhouse and it had this kind of, it's an 1800, it's from 1800 a farmhouse that had been the family for since that time, uh, surrounded by still intact sheds and buildings like this and made of, of both stone and earth construction. And often nowadays, you'll see this kind of corrugated red sheeting um, on agricultural buildings. And it had that. Um, in the plan, you'd see that that was those two buildings. Um, there were also these ruined sheds, which were stables along that side that didn't have roofs. And then more of a, a kind of 1930s typical, what they call Dutch billies here, uh, 
red clad, corrugated red clad barn here. So we have all these elements of the farmyards and rather than renovate the structure, uh, we kind of liked it as its ruined state. And so we decided to place one more of these kind of simple volumes into this composition, which had evolved over time, um, into that composition to reinforce, I suppose, these uh, protected yards. And then to make all of these uh, formal, formerly internal rooms, external garden rooms that the building would look into. Oops, sorry. And here quite clearly, you can see all these points of resonance, I suppose, with the gables and gables were kind of very prevalent on the site when we arrived there to proportions of openings to material finishes. And again, that question of the double and this idea of simultaneity that, at least in my view, when I look at this image, it is very old and very new at the same time. Uh, here's the ruined farmhouse once we took the roof off. Um, and so uh, we kept everything, the windows, everything we could keep, we kept. Um, we had to do a bit of restructuring of the gable, but, um, uh, and really these types of uh, openings became the model for how we would make openings in the building. You know, very simple masonry construction with a lintel on the top of it done. Um, you can see also we were pulling off of the kind of red corrugated. And here we have these gardens, which are very freshly planted here, but you know, ideally would then be these kind of nearly overgrown garden rooms within each of the former interiors. Uh, we're actually looking directly at Scotland there. Can't quite see it. Um, and in this instance, you, in this view, you can see those kind of open gables and garden rooms coming out of the old house here and then the old stable rooms. Again, we were interested in structure, and in this case, um, again, this idea that the structure could be a figure in the room, but also the structure might refer to the kind of gableiness of, of the site. And so we decided to make a ridge supported rafter roof again, but in this case, supported by masonry gables within the building. And that the ridge supports spans more or less the same distance, except in the big room, uh, where it spans the same distance because of that column replacing one of the gables to interpose then, or to add a kind of, uh, somehow a, a sense of discovery in the interior, we interposed this idea of tented ceilings in between these constructive or structural elements. So the external form is given by its desire to refer to the things around it, and it's kind of quite straightforward structural strategy, but the internal spaces then are somehow freed and become more interesting and diverse through this abstract, purely formal element of the tents dropped into it. So here you see a section, I suppose, looking from the old rooms and these little kind of hallway tents to the long section where we see, uh, you know, this we actually into the gable, we placed a hip and this half hip to the kids' room, which has a, this, that triangular oculus you may have noticed, which gets the south light in and makes this lovely projection in the room all day long. Here you see again, this kind of immediate direct resonance with the oak uh, in that shed. And here we have it now in the room where very standard precast lintels were set off with the blockwork wall, which is simply brushed with a, a mortar. And then we have, so we have this kind of articulate, tectonic, maybe real constructive specific base uh, upon which we have a dialogue with something abstract and compositional. And uh, so that's sort of a theme I suppose we're exploring a lot in, in the work now. And often that abstract plastic uh, element is about catching light. And in this case, as opposed to in Balala, we were interested in all those interactions and making elemental somehow the structural interactions here, they're suppressed so that it really can somehow float as this figure in the space. Here, uh, we're looking out of the master bedroom uh, to what was the living and kitchen, kitchen of the 1800s house, still with the old stove there. And then here, we're looking back at that master bedroom from that room. So ideally, this will get very much overgrown with ferns and things over, over years. OK, so uh, nearly there. I uh, just wanted to talk briefly about our ideas about what else structure might do. 
Um, and uh, about how, yes, it has this kind of experiential quality, but perhaps it could be responsive or operate in other ways. So um, for instance, in this extension, yes, we still have this idea about the kind of figure and the kind of textured background, um, but we also were interested in it making a kind of contextual read. So here in the room, we made a, an angled uh, ring beam, which acted somehow like a cornice to the timber roof. And of course, that's referring directly to all the other rooms in the house where you have the kind of decorative cornice, let's say. Um, or in this case, where you know the thickness of the wall of the return uh, above was a certain width, but we were interested in having the most slender column the engineer would allow. And so you just have this you know, very slight response to those two conditions, the head of the column. Or in this case, where uh, the structure evolved from the idea of making the gutter uh, between the two rooms, essentially in the roof, uh, separating the beams then to allow that gutter to happen, and then articulating that in, in the, the kind of hopper at the end, so that the structure might be responsive to weather or drainage or something like that. So, last project, um, uh, again showing you something absolutely amazing that's better than what I'm going to show you that I made. Um, uh, here, this is a, a very famous. Uh, Palladian house called Rustborough House, which I'm not going to show you. Instead, I'm interested in this building out here, which is uh, a 19th century ride, um, which is a circular building uh, for the purposes to, you know, obviously to allow people to ride their horses or go for a walk on, on a rainy day. Um, and so it's a kind of absolutely beautiful thing. It's a pure circle out in the field. And when we look at the structure, you know, at the first, it's just, you know, clear it's cast iron. And actually, there's a very lovely detail that we look at it a bit more closely and we see that well to prevent you know the columns from rusting you know they're set up on these granite posts and the granite posts are octagonal um, and so that's kind of elegant and then you look again and you see that in fact the gutter that surrounds that middle circle is in fact draining at every column into the column so in fact they're doubling as rainwater downpipes as well as structural elements and then you look again and you see that oh well actually that base has a small hole in it, and that that small hole uh, uh, allows the water to drip out and into these small basins where a horse might take a drink. Um, so it's a water trough before it then drains away into the central cistern. So really a, an extraordinary thing where structure has somehow become responsive to weather as well as to the program of the building. Uh, and another, I suppose, structural type uh, thing we see quite often, you might refer to it as the structure, structural type, my friend Andrew calls these casual buttresses. Um, and really it's about a kind of post facto buttress, right? That when you have failing timber roofs and you have uh, unreinforced masonry walls, oftentimes they start to fail. Um, and so you get these, these kind of buttresses added after the fact. Um, and they're everywhere and they're all somehow kind of lovely especially when they're made out of uh, six foot long solid gone, uh, solid granite posts like these ones. But we find them in all sorts of kind of more informal ways, right? Uh, piles of stones leaned against a building is a kind of post facto structural solution. So with those two things in mind, we return again to uh, Clifton um, and actually past Clifton. So to get out there from Dublin, again, you, you drive through Connemara, which is really extraordinary, uh, probably even for people in Scotland. Um, and we drive through Clifton Town, uh, which is a, kind of the last outpost of humanity. Um, and if we keep going, we end up out here on this you know, rugged and kind of amazing landscape um, uh, on the Atlantic, on the North Atlantic. And the next thing really is America. Um, and so you really feel at this point that you've left kind of all civilization behind and the weather is ever present and the wind is ever present. And so in a way we thought we could make a house out there, which was about these things, right? Which was about the rain. And I always refer to this project as a space for rain. So again, unfortunately we were given uh, one of these um, and for all the same reasons we weren't able to knock it down. Um, and so the idea again was to add something to it in a way which, and to strip this back in order to make a kind of cohesive whole out of difficult parts. Um, here's the site plan, and again, I've included construction drawings here for you guys for hopefully of, of interest. Um, and so this is the exist existing house after we re-roofed it, we have this kind of connecting element, and then we have a new large hall room 
Uh, again, the strategy overall is similar to the Bialala house, but trapping a courtyard in this case then that provides us this kind of very warm, sheltered microclimate, and it all looks out over the bay here. So this is what it looked like after the fact. So we stripped it back. We're utilizing the red roof again. So the resonance with the farmyard types and the more contemporary versions of those farmyard types is there materially and formally. But then those ideas, I suppose, about, about dealing with the rain, about having a structure which is responsive to the rain, and then this idea about post facto buttresses uh, became motivational. Um, so we have what was the old house here, and we've stripped off the roof and re-roofed it and restructured it such that its horizontal forces are dealt with through these external buttresses. And then we've structured our extension in that same way. So I'll go into it a bit more. So here you can see that We've taken all of the horizontal restraint out of the roof structure in here. This is our extension. And so there's no horizontal restra restraint. All of the horizontal forces and vertical load go into these eaves beams, which then transfer that load to these external buttress elements. And then those external buttress elements also have to deal with the rain. Here's the construction plan. Uh, so you can see this is the sort of entrance porch here. Um, this, all of this is the old house, which we, in fact, very little to. We trimmed off the kind of extension element here, a few internal walls, and then we re-roofed and restructured it. Um, and then here's the connecting element or kind of hall room, which in a way is thought of like the whole house as a sort of sanctuary or a sheltered place away from the rain where you can observe it. And it, it's given a space externally, but it's also about providing shelter from this constant onslaught. And so. It takes on a nearly kind of ecclesiastical or, or sanctuary type feeling with a small pantry here and then a space to eat in the window there. Here you can see some of how the building deals with the rain. So we went to a great deal of trouble then for the structural elements to receive a gutter that is hung 150 mil from the bottom of the uh, roof edge. And then the down pipes are all concealed in the buttresses and then the water comes back out again and goes into these gullies. So you get these kind of dispersions and concentrations of the rain, and you experience it and hear it in a number of different ways. There unfortunately, were 12 buttresses. Each had to be different than every other. That's looking from the exterior through to the courtyard. Here is one of the buttress corners, which happily ended up being a flying buttress, so detached from the body of the building, so you can kind of sneak around through the back there. And we're looking here at the extension. There you can see the light coming through the flying buttress. This again is the detail. So the extension was built in a way with an external leaf of block work on a simple raft foundation. However, the internal uh, leaf was all in timber. Um, so we have uh, the roof and exposed rafters, parts of the walls and exposed studs, um, and then an insulated cavity and then block externally. And again, all of these rafters land on these external eaves beams and transfer that load to uh, the buttresses and the gutters are all hung and caught by those buttresses. This is the junction between the old house and the courtyard. So part of that, that dropping of the gutters is so that whenever it rains, when the water comes off the roof in those various you know, valleys of the corrugate, that you get these kind of small rivulets running off into the gutter and you see it out of every window. Uh, internally, then, uh, it benefits from this lack of horizontal restraint, right? So we were able to then have an extremely delicate, uh, very fine uh, timber structure internally, which is ideally really counterposed against this kind of really strong, sheltering external appearance, gives you this kind of delicate thing inside. So that kind of dialectic between those two things. And then internally, we were also interested, again, in this idea that there's something constructive and tectonic versus something maybe more abstract uh, more formal, more universal. Uh, there's just a section showing again how the all that comes into those ease beams. Looking again out at that flying buttress moment, 
in behind this curve is the small pantry room. Uh, some of you will be wondering who our timberman is. I will not tell you his name, um, but I will tell you a little bit about, bit about the work he did. So here again, it's this kind of uh, curve that gets you this seat looking out at the landscape. Again, still underneath the sheltering of the eaves. And you can see here how the dropped gutters gets these nice light effects and on rainy days uh, or allows us to watch the rain. Um, in fact, the client's uh, daughter said that she prefers the house when it's raining because it comes a lot and it really does. Uh, I included some constructional things again, just for your interest. Here's a kind of more real construction detail again, showing the kind of block work outer leaf, these kind of muscly eaves, beams and buttresses, um, showing how the, the rafters, structural rafters come and land on this eaves beam, but then there's this kind of upper element which comes out and catches the, the overhanging eaves. But you know, basically, it's similar to the last construction of the Battle House with, with rafters, plywood, um, insulation, and then battens sandwiched all together. And profile to look like this. And we were very careful, I suppose, about alignments between beams and, you know, as you can see here, between beams and undersides of gutters, and between edges of corrugate, and how the rafters are cut, and how those would support the straps. There's a lot in it. Um, then just some, I thought you might like some construction photographs here is uh, when it was just this kind of bizarre monument on the top of this hill in the middle of nowhere. Um, this is when the client was probably absolutely freaking out about what she had done and why she had chosen this architect. Um, but also I suppose it gets to the kind of amazing work of our builder who uh, had to figure not just where the walls were going to be and what angle the roof was going to be at, but then exactly how that would relate to the gutters and how they would be cast in place from the beginning and the falls set within them from many months before a gutter would arrive on site. Uh, here, if this works, is the very nervous day when we, after lots and lots of planning and models made in the office and tons of drawings speculating about how water would run off of corrugate in the west of Ireland and whether it would overshoot the gutter or not, this is the extremely technical <laughs> test of that. Where the, uh, we had a bit of gutter and the, and the buttresses were made and the lads had a milk jar jug. And uh, thank God it worked because there wasn't really much we could do if it didn't. Okay, here's uh, again a lovely day on site where again we built in a way the kind of roof and the outer shell of this thing first. So we had this moment where this external structure was there, the roof structure was there um, uh, before any walls were. A good day on site. Uh, our timberman, as you can tell, is absolutely amazing and he has a machine that will, he draws everything, every element first, and then has a CNC machine that makes a uh, mortise and tenon joints uh, and often dovetail mortise and tenon joints <clears throat> between every single element. Um, and so in a way it's kind of medieval construction nearly where all the elements are pre-made in a shop and numbered and then assembled on site, but also with kind of absolutely utmost of construction technology, absolutely most advanced, I suppose. And so between this image and this image, that's the same day. So he comes and clicks it all into place and we get that kind of refinement thanks to him. Okay, and last but not least, then uh, you know you may have noticed that you know at the bottom of every one of these twelve buttresses we had a, a, a little cast concrete gully, um, and uh, that was a lovely little experiment in the office because we wanted all twelve of them to be different. So we had lots of these sort of experiments, and the builder agreed to let us do it, or he would do it for us if we made the inserts into the concrete molds. So this was a, some of our experimentation, I suppose, about what they might be. And here's a few of those 12 uh, where everyone is different as you find your way around the house. And that is all, and I'm sorry that I went over. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Ryan, thank you very much. Um, we've, uh, 
I think I can only assume that everyone was mesmerized and um, has been left um, completely speechless. Um, but I think Kieran and myself um, had gathered a couple of questions uh, while you were speaking. Um, so Kieran said he was going to start off with an easy question. And uh, what is the internal gutter for the, is it, how do you pronounce it? Is it Leogun? Leogun, yeah. Leon, yes. Leon, yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's not exciting at all. It's very bog standard. It's like a sealed well and downpipe, um, and we just had to be sure. And there's a bunch of them, I suppose. Um, we just had to be sure that there were moments when the beams would cross at the corners that would get us, uh, I suppose, the width uh, to have that sealed well and downpipe. But it's all internal, I suppose. Not as exciting as some of the later gutters. So if I can just add in that I didn't mean the external gutter, but I think oh. internally in that house that the, you can see the beams disappear past the structure, so they don't appear to sit on it. And I wondered if that was why you had done that. Was they had a little upstand that hides with the beam, with the, the trusses? Well, yeah, yeah, that it gets us, yeah, that the, that upstand internally makes allows us to conceal all the kind of structural mess internally and allowed us to run actually electrics and everything back up there. Um, and that then would allow us then to correspond with the gutter on the opposite side so that the depth of it, so it looked like the same beam. Everyone thinks it's the same beam because it's the same depth internally and externally, but actually they both drop down and conceal some things and are separated, yeah. A little bit of trickery, I guess. But yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing some of the construction details as well, because it's amazing to actually see those drawn and they're like beautifully presented as well. Um, yes. So um, uh, I was wondering, so your, your knowledge and understanding of all the local construction and architecture is so in depth. And I think you displayed that um, uh, through your talk. So, and I thought that especially considering um, that you're not originally from Ireland and that you studied architecture you know, elsewhere in the States. So I'm curious um, just if that knowledge is gathered mostly from sort of visual analysis and book learning or whether you engage and speak with local kind of craft builders and, and specialists to learn about these kind of unique details? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely not book learning very much. Some of the typological stuff is, there's a, a great book called Lost Tradition, which has a lot of the typological information about old Irish architecture in it, which, so that was, that's a constant reference still. Um, but, uh, thankfully, I suppose most builders in Ireland aren't interested in contracts and RFIs and things like this, right? They, they just want to get on with it. Mm -hmm. And so much of the work and the resolution of things on, is done on site through conversation. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, so in a way, I suppose, first of all, there's an interest there on my part. I want to know everything there is to know about these buildings and how they work. So I'm always asking questions of people. Um, but most of it is found bit by bit accumulated over years on site. Um, and I'm always trying to make, I dislike, I suppose, whenever I feel like I'm, I'm imposing some, and, and people here sort of don't, you know, I suppose, like things to be direct somehow, maybe. I mean, I'm making a vast cultural uh, generalization there, but, um, and I don't like to feel like I'm imposing some high architectural, you know, abstract concept, which has nothing to do with either how it's built or what a client might want. I try to yeah. avoid that. And so when I'm on site, I'm always asking the builders, how would you do this ordinarily? How do you want to do it? And then I go back and I figure out how to make that nice or interesting or beautiful because often it's not, but I try to do that. I, I want to have that conversation first. So I'm, I'm calling the timber guy, how would you do this? And he says, well, I'd like to do it this way. I think, okay, that's ugly, but I can do it similarly <laughs> in his way, right? And so it helps to get kind of buy-in and then helps me make things which are affordable, you know? I mean, one of, one of Karen's comments, uh, questions before was about the budgets, you know, nothing you saw there even approached a million euro. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've never done a million euro job. Um, the, the most of those projects are all vastly below that, you know. So, um, uh, so building with ordinary skill levels and ordinary construction types is essential to allowing that to happen. I suppose. Buildability, yeah, completely. Buildability, yeah. So when you ask about craft builders and specialists, 
it, for the most part, there's my timber guy. You know, the timber guy is uh, an absolute Jedi and very accommodating and really interested in working with us and really interested in interesting things and has an unbelievable amount of skill and the equipment to deliver on it. So when we do a lot of those roof structures, he's involved, but for the most part, everything else is buildable by hopefully anybody. Um, and uh, I, I don't I don't get some like fancy builder that I drive out to Clifton, I get the local builder, you know? Yeah. Now, thankfully for that Clifton project, the local builder was absolutely amazing. And that project really, the Beach Road project really only happened because the timber guy is amazing and the, and, and the builder was amazing. Um, that's great. That's for sure. And then um, <clears throat> I think um, you obviously spoke a lot about um, building structure um, on, a, on all of your projects. So um, kind of moving on to that, uh, Kieran's asked um, who your structural engineer is and uh, how your relationship is with them. And at what point does the structural design impact on the architectural design? Um, yeah, I, I guess I use a lot of engineer, engineers, actually. I'm just looking for people that I can work with and are interested in the conversation again, right? Again, it's often that same conversation. What's the ordinary way to do this? And how can I make it different somehow? Um, so again, I don't need, I don't need like the era of advanced geometry in it or something, you know? I, I, can, I can work with nearly any engineer and I do you know, have three or four. Um, I suppose also that um, the structural things that I'm trying to do tend to be tr quite direct, I guess, in their ambition. Again, I'm not interested in gymnastics very much. I don't like cantilevers, you know? <laughs> um, so uh, uh, yeah, so in a way, in principle, I would hope that most of the structural strategies are yes, arrive quite early in the design process and are quite direct and something that I could even grasp. Uh, I did do a year of engineering, which I should say also before I, structural engineering before see, I transferred to architecture. This, so. is gonna be, this is gonna be my next question. Some I, experience, I, I thought I suppose. Your, your interest in structure seemed um, and a more advanced, I, I would say, than probably most most architects. Yeah, so. I came out of that world, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, now I, of course, I've forgotten all of it though. So I know like bare concepts. I couldn't do like long division if you asked me to. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Karen's got another one here. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, so how much uh, thinking time goes into projects? Uh, how many projects do you work on at a time? Um, and then how much site research do you do? We'll start with those three and then we'll, we'll look at the next one. Yeah. Um, I suppose probably, uh, well, I mean, I teach as well and I teach partly because I spend too much time on the work in the office that, that can't make the money it needs to, you know? So, um, because I am, I suppose, uh, relentlessly self-critical and I just can't let something out of the office that I don't find interesting or good, even slightly, you know, I can't, I don't, I don't, if it goes into the world and I'm not happy with it, I just, I, I, I can't deal with it, I suppose. So I do work, I suppose, I give it whatever the time it needs to, to get to that point. Um, and I do tend to work nights and things to allow that to happen, I guess, you know, probably many nights a week, I'm sitting at the table drawing things. So um, the correspondence between like time and making money is not a factor in the office really, you know, I spend whatever time it needs. Um, uh, and um, the number of projects at a time uh, has certainly gone up, I suppose. Um, you know, we probably have I don't know, maybe 15 or so that are in various stages right now. I think it's too many, frankly. Um, but that also is because of, I've always, you know, I didn't have, um, just from a business perspective, I, I didn't come here with connections. I didn't know anybody. I don't have family. I don't have college friends. I don't have kids I grew up with. I had nobody who would form the usual basis to start a practice, right? Um, so when I started, I had to take everything um, and to kind of slowly build up that base of people who knew you and someone would say, oh, call this guy or, you know. Um, so the practice is is commercially minded in that way, you know. Um, and uh, so I still have like take lots of very small work and 
you know, range of scales and stuff. And uh, again, it's just trying to stay in business and to, yeah, yeah, I suppose keep building a base. Um, uh, and so I have a lot of those projects because a lot of them are super small, you know, they don't have, you know, some 15 million euro house that can, you know, run an office for a few years. So. Yeah, we, we, were, we were talking sort of just before the talk about how um, you've had some old clients come back to you, you know, following the whole uh, pandemic situation, looking to kind of expand and stuff. So, you know, it's that's the building the base. Um, that you yeah, talking. if they come back, that's good, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and so I, I suppose on that note, um, Kieran's asked, you know, how, how you manage clients in your design process um, and whether they get in the way. Um, uh, how I manage them, I suppose I always try to get everyone, well, it's easier now because I have a certain amount of work built after 10 years of doing this. And so people tend to start coming to me for the things that they think I will do, you know, and know that my approach, I suppose. That's much easier to manage clients now than say six years ago when they're, you know, they would come to me because they're just because their uncle said, you know, call that guy. And it's more difficult to manage, you know. So, um, uh, also, I, I'm very interested in having buy-in. You know, I really, like I said, I hate this idea that I'm imposing some, you know, architect's grand idea on somebody that they have to live with. And uh, so, I only really do things that clients are happy to be have, have done. And so, we do. You know, you see in the website or whatever. There's lots of models. We're always making models to bring people along. I do lots and lots of hand sketches in early stages for clients, like perspectival things we, we do 3d modeling a lot but all of that is for client buy-in really um you know you wouldn't see very many renderings on my website we're producing lots of them i'm just not showing any of them because they're really there for I'm more interested in the built thing and the rendering and stuff are for clients to yeah, be happy and be interested and engaged and want to do what we're doing um with and with private clients and domestic clients it's all the more important yeah um when they get when they get in the way I actually really like it. Uh, it's like I mentioned briefly about that client wanting curves, and you know, That's, I have this, yeah. uh, I have other clients who, you know, um, uh, yeah, would push back on some of the knee jerk things that I would do, or my my kind of natural reactions to things, and I really enjoy that because it really forces me to look at projects in ways that I'm not comfortable with, rather than just being comfortable with like you know, what I usually do or something or my usual approach. So I prefer it when they get in the way, especially on the design. If they're getting in the way in other things, obviously that's problem. But especially in the design, I like it. But it keeps it interesting, keeps it challenging. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, I say thank you again. And I'm just gonna uh, hand over to Kieran then for the thanks. Yeah, I was just gonna say thanks very much, Ryan. I, I personally really enjoyed it. I think our, we might have rethink how we do questions, I think, in, Maybe Alice and I can have a chat about that after this, because um, I think it's it's a discursive talk, isn't it? It's quite hard to ask very basic questions in the chat, but I've got loads mm -hmm. of questions. Maybe I could email you my questions after this. Yeah, feel free. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I just want to say thanks very much on behalf of the Edinburgh Architecture Association. Thank you for taking time. I know this this is a big commitment for, for architects to give talks like this, and um, but thank you for, for doing that. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks again for inviting me. And sorry, I, I spoke too long. I'll, I'll edit next time. <laughs> oh, all. Great. Very grateful. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have, Have a good night. Day. And thanks, everybody, for coming along. Cheers. I appreciate it.